filmmaking is going, or, or reading a story or anything, the beauty is going into this world for the first time and not knowing where it's going to take you. And having written it and shot it and been in the editing room every day for five, six months, I, I haven't actually seen the film in the way one should, you know, with a blank mind. Born in Akron, Ohio in 1953, Jim Jarmusch couldn't wait to move to New York and attend Columbia University. Graduating with a BA in English, Jarmusch was accepted to the Tisch School of the Arts and the opportunities grew from there. His true film school was the time he spent working on 1980's Lightning Over Water and it didn't take him long to shoot his own first feature, Permanent Vacation. Vacation showed Jarmusch had promise and a keen eye and it gave him the confidence to hold out for a financier who would afford him full creative control. That financier was Otto Grockenberger, a German producer who helped Jarmusch make a monster of a sophomore film, 1984 Stranger Than Paradise. Paradise won the Camera d'Or at the 1984 Cannes Film Festival, an award given to first-time filmmakers. Permanent Vacation was considered a student film by the jury. The purpose of the award is to encourage promising directors to create more art, and Jarmusch did just that in a busy 1986, shooting a video for the talking head song The Lady Don't Mind, the first of three coffee and cigarette shorts that would eventually become part of a larger project, and a feature film called Down By Law. Down By Law is a bit of a cult hit among fans of Singer and Down By Law star Tom Waits, and after its somewhat disappointing box office performance, Jarmusch lay low for a few years, shooting a few music videos and shorts, and re-emerging in 1989. 1989's Mystery Train, a story about a pilgrimage to Memphis, was as obscure and disappointing at the box office as any of Jarmusch's films, due to his insistence on not dealing with major studios. But it was easily his most satisfying to date, and he continued to show off his flair for storytelling. In the interim between Mystery Train and 1991's Night on Earth, Jarmusch shot his second Coffee and Cigarettes featurette and another Tom Waits video. Night on Earth was another example of the vignette style of storytelling that Jarmusch was toying with, and it featured his most star-studded cast to date. It was the beginning of a trend, as 1995's Dead Man afforded Jarmusch the opportunity to work with Johnny Depp and Crispin Glover, and 1999's Ghost Dog, Way of the Samurai, saw him cast Forrest Whitaker. In 2003, he released his magnum opus, the United Segments of Coffee and Cigarettes as one feature. Eleven vignettes shot over 17 years starring musicians like Iggy Pop and Tom Waits, comedians like Stephen Wright, and massive stars like Kate Blanchett. A massive undertaking like this would be difficult to follow up, but Jarmusch managed 2005's Broken Flowers, starring Bill Murray. Flowers was typical of Jarmusch's style and affinity for loners, and Murray would reunite with Jarmusch, but not before 2009's The Limits of Control, a film that reveals itself in a slow and deliberate manner, the same way its audience has. The film was a dud, and it took four years to follow it up, but followed up he did with 2013's Only Lovers Left Alive, which at least made its budget back. Jarmusch didn't just collaborate with musicians, and in 2016 he had poet Ron Padgett compose original poems for Patterson, the story about a bus driver who writes poems about a hometown of Patterson, New Jersey. Adam Driver and Bill Murray were both back for The Dead Don't Die in 2019, and audiences and critics alike are eager to know what's next in an enigmatic and groundbreaking career spanning 35 years. Since 1979, Jim Jarmusch has been the cure for the common film, trailblazing the way independent film was made and consumed. Welcome back to another Director's Cut. I'm your host, John Dunning, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Mr. Jason Alt. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. This was so much fun. Uh, a breath of fresh air, even though this man has been making films since 1979. I mean, uh, if you want to consider, you know, his 1980 film, his first, uh, a lot of people consider Stranger Than Paradise his first movie. I know that the... Uh, Camera to War Jury, the 1984 Con Festival, considered uh, Stranger Than Paradise his first movie. Mm -hmm. And if you consider that his first movie, it was as good a first movie as any of the directors we've profiled on this show. Like uh, our last episode with Sam Mendes, Jarmusch doesn't have 25 ways to be a happier director, but he, in a very Jarmuschian fashion, he has <laughs> the five golden rules. I think this is a good way to to frame this, this kind of thesis uh, of how we kind of dive into this. Do you have a special guest to get us through this one, Jason? Absolutely. I have a very, very special guest. Uh, I've decided to crack open one of the... Um, I'm not aging this because uh, it was sold to me cold, so uh, I pulled out one of my Dogfish Head 120-minute IPAs for this episode. Oof. 
Um, I have some that are two years old and some that are three years old, just chilling in my cellar. But like, if you buy them cold, you can't really age them. So it's just been in my beer fridge staring at me. So I decided to uh, crack one of those suckers open. So this is a special episode. It deserves a special beer. That is a special brew, my friend. Uh, I am on uh, coffee just, you know, to be th- on theme tonight. And I'm also fighting back a uh, hangover from last night turned into a migraine today. So, Lahayam huh. to all of our viewers and listeners. At least it's not a shot of NyQuil this time. Not this time. That was for Cronenberg. Although, it, you know, J- Jim Jarmusch and, and Cronenberg, uh, they're, they would be hard to pick out of a lineup. It looks a little bit like David Lynch, too, I think. Oh, geez, yeah. Instead of going into depth about each one, because they're pretty wordy, and if you want to read them for yourself verbatim, you can find them on the internet. And in the show notes for this episode. Rule number one basically states that, you know, there are no rules that don't let anyone else kind of tell you what to do that, you know, it's it's kind of whatever project you're working on creatively is kind of your own thing. Yeah. I mean, he says later in this rule, like, there are no rules, even these rules that I'm talking about right now. <laughs> he basically he left NYU film school because a professor was trying to say, look, this is how you deal with actors. And I feel like Jarmusch even back then thought that you should deal with each actor individually. So, yep, that's uh, that's a good point. Rule number one is there there are no rules. Uh, I think that's really interesting that he led with that. Rule number two is uh, don't let the fuckers get you. And I, by that, he means people who finance and distribute films and promote them. They're not filmmakers. So they're going to try to keep creative control away from you. They're going to try to give you less money than you need. You know, they're they're not really interested in the art. They're, they think filmmaking is a business. So don't right. let them get you. A sub part of that is uh, avoid sycophants at all costs. Don't know anything about it, you know? So, right. Number three, he's basically talking about the, the production uh, is there to serve the film. So a lot of the times he stated that he kind of lets films grow organically, even sometimes while he's still making it. Um, and, and that's kind of a hard thing for, again, you know, f- financers of the films or uh, collaborators sometimes. The film is not being made to serve their budget or their schedule or the resumes of the people involved. Absolutely. You know, a lot of people, again, that's like tied into part two. If you really look at this is how he feels about the, like Hollywood and like the film industry, like he gets five rules and like two of them are about this is why I self-finance all my own movies. It's really interesting. <laughs> Number four, filmmaking is a collaborative process. You get the chance to work with others whose minds and ideas may be stronger than your own. And that is something verbatim that Sam Mendes also said. And so it's really interesting is cynical as uh you know as jermish is and contrast that with like how mendez was like yeah i'll make your studios film you want to make, make bond movies we'll make bond movies jermish is the total opposite of a filmmaker as as mendez in so many ways but they both basically said filmmaking is a collaborative process work with the people you want to work with and um allow smart people to give you their good ideas yeah, and number five is, is probably my favorite, uh, very Jarmuschian uh, rule, and that is nothing is original, still from anywhere that resonates with inspiration and fuels your imagination. Devour old f- films, new films, music, saying that it's 2019 and everything has pretty much been done in some shape or another. Uh, so don't feel bad about being inspired by things and letting that really truly ring out. Now, on the other side of it, you know, make it your own voice, of course. Uh, no one wants to see the same thing played over and over again except if you're Wes Anderson you know how to do it correctly but <laughs> in this case you know he he's I, I like that he's not he, he's such a purist but he's not so much of a purist where he's just like all oh, my my ideas are are just completely original he's just like no I, I get inspired by weird shit and then I m- yeah. make movies around it well the best quote I found from Jarmish anywhere was in this fifth rule he said authenticity is invaluable originality is non-existent everything is a greek tragedy or shakespeare really when you look at there are like seven major plots and shakespeare wrote five of them and also shakespeare stole everything he did he made up a lot of words but like romeo and juliet was based on an italian play called romeo and juliet (laughs) yeah you know so he he says it's um you know is that Truffaut quote it's not where you take things from it's where you take them to so I, I think uh, I think that's very important. It tells you a lot about him as a filmmaker. So if you want to read that the full list and kind of like his notes about it, 
Um, that's something that's online, and we'll try to remember to put it in the show notes. But I just really thought that was interesting to contrast that with the Sam Mendez episode we did uh, recently, which you should be able to find on our YouTube page. Watch it. It's a real good episode. Now kind of jump into what makes his films look the way they do, like kind of his, his visual things that are just – exclusive to a Jim Jarmusch film. Not not exclusive, of course, because it's like, you know, er everyone does long takes, everyone does tracking shots, but there are things that are kind of signatures that he kind of uses and, and goes back to. Well, he uses, the, he uses just a ton of really long shots and not necessarily, you know, moving long shots. It's a lot of people seated, you know, or people having conversations where they, they do real long takes and... I think that sort of establishes pace. He does a lot to establish pace, uh, more than most people. He's he's sort of a master of it, and um, y you know, so those those long shots, and sometimes they're really quiet. You know, there's not a lot going on, so you read facial expressions more. Like punctuating a long shot with like a, a lot of cuts, sort of you don't know where to put your eye every time it comes back, right? So if it, the shot's long and it's not changing, your eye will start to wander. And so you'll start to notice more and more what, about what's going on. So I think he basically tricks you into paying attention to, you know, have your eye drawn other places than where, like, the mouth of the person who's talking. Uh, and I think that tricks you into becoming more observant. Yeah, and a lot of other filmmakers, they do the long shots, whether it being like a long tracking shot or even a long conversation, you know, a no-cut conversation. I want to make a, a comparison with two two films, one that is his and one that's not, and that's uh, Only Lovers Left Alive, comparing that to a movie like uh, uh, Jerry from um, Gus Van Sant. And that, they both include very long silent shots and where where jerry has like casey affleck and and uh matt damon kind of walking in a desert and, and it's supposed to just kind of it's supposed to grind into your brain that it's a hopeless situation that you're lost in the desert and there's there's nothing around you um but it also kind of plays with your attention like house money and your attention span where jarmusch film uh and especially specifically the one that you know i mentioned only lovers left alive it's a lot of mood it it does so much like some of his long takes in this film of just watching like tom hiddleston sitting in a, in his room listening to music says so much and progresses so much for his character development than whether it you know whether tilda swinton walks in the room they talk about their experiences for the last you know couple hundred years because they're like ancient vampires he does that and he does do a lot of like one takes where they like conversational one takes uh, a lot of back and forth like a coffee and cigarettes but the ones that really kind of just sit in the room and you're you're watching just someone take take in emotion or or just listening to music is something that he does well where it's not boring at all yeah, you can almost compare the uh, some of the scenes from uh, Coffee and Cigarettes, like Tom Waits talking to Iggy Pop, with like the diner scene from Heat, mm -hmm. where you c you contrast that with somebody like Soderbergh who would have put the camera stationary, right? You know, versus so you feel like you're at the table. You kind of feel like you're at the table in a different way, like you're looking back and forth at who's talking, right? Like you're you're the third seat. So uh, I, th I think he did that effectively. But, um, yeah. yeah, not a, like you said, lots of people do long shots, but this is something that he seemed to have mastered early. Um, I, I think he just mastered pacing, and I don't know. I guess that was something inherent because right down to his first film, he does something that uh, nobody has done this well since the film Hudson Hawk, which is a masterpiece where... <laughs> They uh, they don't use watches for a bank job. They sing songs that are the uh, correct amount of time for mm -hmm. all the time they'll need to do the heist. So they know like they know how much time they have left based on where they are in the song. Which I thought that w it was a it was dumb, and they even made fun of it in the movie. But it was just I don't know that movie was silly. But I, I kind of I thought about that because he uses music to establish things are happening in real time. Also, 
like very, from his very first movie where the the character gets off the plane and then she's walking to her uh, cousin's apartment she's got i got a spell on you playing on a uh, like a tape recorder as she's walking and you notice that like the song playing in real time as she's walking sort of measures the amount of time you know that's gone by in real time mm-hmm. using y- using long takes and songs that you you know their length and you know the the pace of the song it, it puts up a yardstick against what's happening and you're like okay this is you know a, a definite length a definite tempo so he sort of measures out real time by playing really long cuts of songs too so i i thought that was something that is pretty unique to him and he's been doing that since essentially his first film and, and even with silence too sometimes he he devoids everything uh, as far as even music and, and again i'll go back to the the film i was just talking about only lovers left alive where there's a scene where uh jeffrey wright is is playing a like a hemoglobin tech uh and he is just kind of sitting there at his computer screen, futzing with whatever on, on his desk. And it's kind of a long take of that, but then there's little nuanced uh, uh, sound effects in the background. And then, you know, he turns around and kind of gets that little jump scare of, of seeing Tom Hiddleston, you know, standing there very quietly in a very awkward, you know, old school stethoscope, you know, doctor get up. He lets scenes breathe. What makes it special is that he still has enough interesting things in frame or even off frame to still hold your attention where a lot of other filmmakers kind of don't. I think that's uh, that's fair to say. You know, there's not a lot visually that he does that's super unique to him other than like insisting on doing black and white a lot, which, you know, I'm fine with. But I, I, I like the the reason for, though. Like in Dead Man, he, he wants it to, to feel alien. He wants. He doesn't want you to feel like. He doesn't want the movie to feel like it's a John Wayne film, even though it's kind of a western tone. It's more of a psychedelic movie, if you if you think about it. He well, wants... he thinks westerns are allegorical. Right. Right. Yeah. He says the the western is an allegory that America uses to process its own history. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times, you know, the like the John Wayne type stuff, it had ideology stamped all over it, and he wanted to use it just as sort of a vehicle for telling like you said a psychedelic story that's why it was very important to take that familiarity out he wants it to feel like an alien world because you know conversely you could say the whole movie is like set in a in a purgatory state so you know it, it, yes it looks like it's a familiar place even like sitting on a train but he also wants it to feel that unsettling like where it's familiar but in like a dreamlight state movies about a case of mistaken identity always do feel pretty alien because like the person has basically the film breaks the number one rule of improv where you tell somebody, well, I guess that's a number two rule of improv uh, where you tell somebody who they are and they don't let you don't let them tell you who they are. So when they're like, Oh, you're this William Blake. He spent the whole movie having his identity confused and trying to, to blend into that role. So like, Stories like that always do feel unsettling where you sort of like you're waiting for the character to, to show you who they are. And then people are like, nope, you are clearly this person. And then they're playing along. That always feels weird. So the, the fact that it's black and white, I think, really elevated some of that. My favorite stories from him. And this is, you know, a bit of trivia. He would always like to work with Crispin Glover again. But he said he's kind of a weirdo and they almost got into a fist fight. Uh, on on set, so I always thought oh my that was god, really funny. two skinny guys <laughs> <laughs> slapping each other. Yeah, Chris McGlover's he's great. If you haven't seen that interview, I think it was Letterman where he was just mm-hmm. like you could have blindfolded him with dental floss. He was on some. <laughs> he was uh, he was he came out high as a kite and just gave a real weird interview. Wasn't that the junket for Willard or something? <laughs> 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 It might have been that, he, that guy's had a real weird career. He like started off real strong, did like a bunch of really good roles, and then sued Hollywood. <laughs> you can't do that <laughs> visually. Like he doesn't do a ton remarkable, but he does. You can tell he's a good student of film. Mm-hmm. So um, I I like some of the 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 visual stuff he does, but I think his. Like thematic elements are more important, not the visual stuff, but the storytelling stuff he does, because we both came up with our own kind of Jeremushian theories and shared them with each other. We came up with this stuff independently. So 
I think uh, we'll probably spend the rest of the episode just talking about that kind of stuff. Just to close out on visuals, of course, there's kind of like the low hanging fruit. Like, yes, you're going to see a lot of spinning. Like, the, the camera looks like it's like a record, you know, it kind of moves that way. And then he's just unabashedly loves that long fade shot, um, especially yeah. in stuff like uh, Dead Man and, and all that. So, you know, not a lot of, or even Broken Flowers, like, not a lot of filmmakers use that style of, of editing but he is uh just as much as he it's he like a lo- sixth grader making a powerpoint presentation <laughs> yeah, exactly Almost. yeah whoever taught george lucas how to do a, a star wipe on on <laughs> a powerpoint yeah. he just loved him so much and he just yeah. cannot get a, a different cut uh, uh what yeah. if the whole scene collapsed down to it was like a tiny point in c-3po's <laughs> butthole and then we went on to the next scene uh, talk about some more of the thematic things because like you said that is kind of the the language of of which he 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 does his films where he's you know not a flashy director he's he could care less about yeah, I, I don't want to say he could care less about what it looks like, but he he cares. He's a very minimalistic director, so it's just like it, it's mostly people talking in a room or or walking through the wilderness. You know, that's not the point. It, it's kind of the 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 theme and, and the and the the feeling is is what he wants you to chew on. Well, a good quote from him was, "Life has no plot. Why must films or fiction?" <laughs> So that's worth talking about. Now, you came up with a theory that I think is really interesting. I think we're going to dive into that next. Um, I'll introduce this by saying lots of filmmakers do like vignette type stuff. And um, uh, so uh, he made like a 17 year long movie called Coffee and Cigarettes that ended up, you know, being a, a, like 11 different vignettes or something like that. It was his boyhood. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. you know, is a, a you know Jim Link musher or something. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know, it's kind of true. Like he just he shot it and then came back to it later, and you know, uh, you know, it all came together eventually. I thought that was cool. But even how he did that shooting over years, he put everything chronologically. Most people who do vignettes like to break stuff up non chronologically. You know, like more like a Pulp Fiction type deal. But he never really did that, and uh, I think that was interesting. And also, he does a lot of three-act movies, but he does a lot of non-three-act movies, too. So, like, for every three-act movie like Stranger Than Paradise or Mystery Train, you got something like Night on Earth that's, like, five vignettes or or Coffee and Cigarettes, which is, like, what, 11? Yeah. You know? So, um, it didn't really feel like a typical vignette movie. And you made an observation I, I'd like you to, to talk about. Music is, of course, a huge part of what makes and what fuels a, a Jim Jarmusch film. Yeah, like films are, or songs are used as like a thesis almost. Right. Like his films, you know, when they're not following a traditional three act or more, I feel like they're it, it's like an album, like almost like it plays out like a rock opera where it they are series of of scenes that are like yes they're connected uh by by an overall you know theme of, of the album almost like a like a coheed and cambria record or like boys night out like train wreck that's another uh album that i could think of that that kind of plays out this way where it has an overarching story but not necessarily a plot it, it, you know like movies like Dead Man are, are very much like that. It's a series of yes, on surface level, it's it starts with uh, our, our main character in you know trying to get a job, and then something happens, and then he has to go out and and kind of figure it out that way. But just the way the scenes are structured, they all feel like independent songs of each other. Ghost Dog is is this way as well. Certain artists have those like breaks in their in their music where it's not just all like, you know, vocals in the band where it will have like a instrumental break as one of the tracks. And I feel like ghost dog has a lot of those and that's, you know, it's scored by the RZA from Wu Tang clan. So that's no mystery to why that is such a, a musically driven film, but even like broken flowers and, and only lovers, I, I feel like they all feel the scenes are set up to where they all feel like uh, songs rather than a, a traditional three act structure. You know, if we'd have been thinking, we would have come up with a, a like a rock opera that felt like every one of these movies. <laughs> You know, like I came up um, with a couple, like you know, Ghost Ghost Dog felt like Kilroy was here by Sticks. There you go. 
yeah. we could have we could we could have done one for each movie. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, who who else is going to pull out uh, Boys Night Out Trainwreck? I mean, you got to really, really dig deep to find that little, <laughs> that little ditty. It's There's a, a Tom Waits album for every one of these movies. <laughs> yeah, and Tom Waits is in every one of the movies. Um, well, he was also in Mystery Men, so. That's true. He utilizes Tom Waits a lot better than um, Tony Scott did in Alpha Dog. <laughs> Domino. Or, or in Domino, not Alpha Dog. It was Domino. <laughs> Sorry. Jesus. Alpha Dog was a good movie, yeah. <laughs> I think that's interesting, and if you go down like you know a list of a lot of these, there's, uh, you know, and you look at the, the the vignettes how they're structured is sort of like how they would be in a concept album more than like four rooms or something like that. Right. Well, like Broken Flowers is is just that, right? Like each interaction is a song, is a different. Uh, it's a different track on yeah. a mixtape. Right. Yeah. So like that was the like his his friend gave him the the mix CD for his road trip and like each uh, woman he was tracking down had her own song. Yeah, you have, you have Sharon Stone as a Kesha tune, Kenny Rogers as uh, Jessica Lange, and then you and then you go to like a like a trashy like Motorhead for for Tilda Swinton, and they all have these different feelings and different different emotions attached to them, like a a different song would be. And yeah, like you said perfectly, it felt like a mixtape through Don Johnston with a T's life. Um, and that was, yeah. it was executed really well. So that's a, that's an interesting theory. I, I like that. And I, I'm sure he might not have even been cognizant of that when he was making these movies, but they really just, they, they felt like that. And it's not like a super original observation to like talk about Jermush and music because like everything right. you Google about Jim Jermush, it uh, nothing but music comes up. Like it's very important to him. The man's a musician. He makes his own original music and he puts a lot of um, musicians in his movies. And uh, you know it's it's not a super original observation. But one thing I did notice was I wanted to talk about how he hangs a lot of stuff on poetry, both the the lyrical aspects of music that does have words but also like literal poems and when you google jarmish poetry nothing comes up except for patterson <laughs> and patterson it was it was very blatant there's a poem called patterson that he liked right. about patterson new jersey so it's like what if the guy's name was patterson and he lived in patterson and he wrote poems so like <laughs> so yeah the 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 poetry is very very obvious in patterson so when you like Look up for people that made observations about poetry in Jarmish movies. Patterson's what comes up. But I feel like he used poetry as a narrative framing device in more than half of his movies. Uh, like you look at something like Ghost Dog, which is as much as RZA did a lot of sampling, which is something Jarmish is a big fan of. Remember, authenticity is invaluable. Originality is non-existent, <laughs> so... Yeah. When Riz is sampling, he's making really, you know, good original, uh, real authentic right, shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's no such thing as an original song because everything was like, you know, a caveman's drum solo. It, the music was in the instrument, just needed me to get it out. Yeah, because nothing's original. <laughs> right. <laughs> but he made real authentic music for that movie. But if you'll notice, there wasn't a ton of lyrical music in Ghost Dog. It was a lot of instrumental and just like non-lyric, not instrumental. What do you call like I don't know, like a RZA song with no words? It just it's whatever. It's just beats, you know. It's mm -hmm. and um, the the narrative structure for the movie didn't come from song lyrics. It came from a, an ancient samurai poem, basically called the the Hagakure, which was um, basically you know the way a samurai should live their life and how. This assassin has decided to live his own life the same way by basically living as the vassal of someone who saved his life and like, okay, that's my that's my guy now, you know, how should I be his servant? Because that's what a samurai was. If you didn't have someone to serve, you might as well die. And that's why so many of them killed themselves when they're, you know, when their uh, shogun went down. So I thought that was, you know, using the Hagakure as a, like a, the, the framing device for the movie was real interesting. And if you look at some of the other movies, you know, like Dead Man was about a poet, basically. You know, he read, he was reading William Blake poetry. But uh, he, the story he tells is that he was reading a bunch of Native American uh, 
philosophy but. trying to to get in the the mindset to write this film and then he's like i need a break he started reading William Blake and, you know, Blake is a poem that he's always really liked and admired. And he went back to some Blake stuff that he'd read a hundred times before. But after reading all these Native American aphorisms, he realized that a lot of the stuff Blake was saying around the same time was very similar to what the Native American aphorisms he was reading. So him writing a movie about a guy named William Blake who was, you know, confused for William Blake with all this, uh, you know, all these Native Americans offering their own aphorisms, you know, that felt like Blake poems. That that was a great framing device for the movie. As much as Neil Young, you know, contributed a lot of music, again, no lyrics. Neil Young, it was just him and a guitar watching a rough cut of the film and then writing the songs from watching it. So when there's a lot of lyrical content in the music, great. That's real obvious. That's like, you know, okay, I got, I put a spell on you as the, the, uh, the thesis for this film. I get it. Right. But a lot of the times he'll do just instrumental music with like no lyrics and use poetry as a framing device. And that's something that he's done in a lot of his movies. And no one's really talked about that. And uh, I thought that was really interesting to observe that song lyrics are poetry, you know, and uh, and he had Rob Paget uh, write original poems for Patterson. And, um, you know, he's collaborated with poets before. So I couldn't find examples in all of his movies. Some of it's just like, OK, there's music. But between music and poetry, there's basically a thesis in some other, somebody else's work of art in almost all of his movies. Yeah. Mystery Train being about basically Elvis, you know. Uh, you know, so much Tom Waits stuff in the er the early stuff he did with Tom Waits, like uh, like Down by Law, you know, and uh, the original Coffee and Cigarette short, which I think he shot the first one with Tom Waits and Iggy Pop before he made Mystery Train. Stop me, I'm rambling. I, no, I, I'm going to tell myself how proud I am of my own observation. <laughs> if, if you don't interfere, I think you're 100 percent right, though. But that's you know, it goes back to where his movies do feel like a, an album and um because they have these backdrops of Neil Young in, in in Dead Man or you know uh like the Rizza but the the content itself is the poetry and it's not like his his words or his dialogue are like a wordy mouthy you know like a PTA I guess um, yeah. where, where everything is just like, it, it has to sound so smart. Like everything's like, oh my God, this conversation is the most interesting thing I've ever heard. No, it picks a theme like, in, like coffee and cigarettes. Like you said, it's like 11, 11 different vignettes of, of different groups coming together, but it all, they're a common thread of, of sitting down with people and, and theorizing over um, vices and things that, um, you know, being uncomfortable with, with your surroundings or the people around you and kind of finding commonality and common ground. And he does that and he delivers that in a way where it's very poetic, even though it's, it's very every man. And I think that he is in a lot of his films and even in like, uh, the dead don't die. He celebrates the every man. Um, where he doesn't make it weird like a David O. Russell does. Like he, David O. Russell puts the mundane on display as as a sideshow. Where yeah, in, in the entire film of Patterson, in the entire runtime, you're waiting on something shitty to happen. You're yeah. waiting on that fucking dog to get stolen, or you're waiting on uh, Patterson to to come home to his wife fucking someone else, and nothing like that happens. It's just. A dude waking up, going to work, and being happy with it. Just being finding finding poetry in the mundane. Um, and it's it's funny you talk you contrast him with David O. Russell because uh, one of David O. Russell's contemporaries, Spike Jones, made a movie. You remember adaptation where Nicolas Cage, who was playing Charlie Kaufman, who's a successful screenwriter, goes to like this hack writer's workshop. Where he's like, I'm trying to write a movie where it's like real life, where nothing happens. And Brian Cox's character lights him up. He's like, every day somebody murders someone. Every day someone, you know, loses their relationship with their best friend over a woman. Like, how the? F why are you wasting my time if you're not trying to do something, right. you know, that that's worth watching? But it's so funny that Jarmusch 
takes like the opposite tack where it's like life has no plot. Why must films are fiction? Why can't I just show people relating to each other? Because really, that's what Jarmusch's movies about are about people relating to each other. And he forces people to find common ground. Right. In a lot of his movies by another thing I notice he does. He has language barriers a lot. Yeah. From his very first movie, you got like a Hungarian dude who moves to America and then his cousin shows up. He's like, don't speak Hungarian. I just I don't want anything to do with it. And she's like, here's something we have in common. We're both from Hungary. We're both family. He's like, I don't I don't want to be part of the family. I don't want to speak Hungarian. Get out of here with this shit. So she has to find new ways to relate to him, even though they're family, even though they're both from the same country and they speak a common language. He forces her to learn to relate to him as a person. And, uh, you know, like um, uh, Down by Law, uh, Roberto Benigni's character barely speaks English. Mystery Train. You know, <laughs> Mystery Train with the Japanese tourists. Yeah. Uh, Dead Man, you know, with uh, the, the language barrier between the the, the natives and, uh, and William Blake, you know. Um, Even with William Blake and nobody uh, conversing and, and they speak the same language. William Blake's just like, I don't understand a word you're saying. And they're, they're speaking the same language because it's so they're coming from such different places. Yeah. Even ghost dog, where he gives that little girl a copy of Rashomon and asks her to, to mm -hmm. read something in another language. You know, uh, that, that book, that Rashomon book got passed between three different characters in that movie. And that was something they all could relate to also. You know, that was something they had in common on the basis of, like, having that experience that was outside of, you know, their own regular experience. I, I he, And the, the his best friend in the movie spoke French. He didn't speak any French. The guy didn't yeah. speak any English, and they were best friends. And they said know? exactly that. I, They I said exactly it. the same thing because yeah. they knew each other so well. Right. Yeah. He knew him so well. He's like, oh, don't you have some business to attend? He was like, I got some business to attend. <laughs> <laughs> they spent so much time together and bonded over the things they had in common. They literally didn't need to speak the same language. There are so many uh, examples of him using a language barrier to force people to, to relate to each other on, on a different basis. And, uh, you know, that's no accident. That's something he's doing deliberately. And uh, I thought that was, uh, that's an excellent technique that he's employed many times successfully. You could even broaden that a, a little bit, like with not only a language barrier, but a background barrier, like with Broken Flowers, he's, you know, the, the character Don Johnson is going through his tour of, it, you know, it's almost like a, a, a reverse version of high fidelity. Yeah, uh, exactly. Where he, he's, you know, he's, he going doesn't through. care what went wrong. He just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he's such a dick. He's just like, I just want to find the kid that I don't want. She All... didn't have a kid. That's another one. I don't have to worry about. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. All, All the women are just come from such different, like if you were to pick one that he had the most in common with, it would probably be Jessica Lange, the one that you could tell has the most animosity towards each other because they just hated each other so much because they were probably so similar. But then, you know, he had the party girl and he had the trailer trash and he had all these different ones. And, and again, but it's so funny how different their lives ended up where they from where they had something in common right. where they really diverged. Yeah, that's another d divergence is uh, a way he loves to end his films. Mm -hmm. Like if you look by uh, look at down by law, literally a split in the road. And the paths go very far from each other. And it's like, okay, we're splitting up for real now. Like, people wildly diverge. And sometimes they come back together like they did in Stranger Than Paradise. And sometimes they never see each other again. So, Broken Flowers, is it's it's really emblematic of, like, well, look how different, like, oh, so, you know, you are you sell real estate now. And you're married to this, you know, fake dick. That's cool. <laughs> or you're, like, living in this... <laughs> really broken down farmhouse without like a, all these broken cars in your yard. Like that's, that's how you ended up. It's so funny that a guy who was so many computers, you know, had so many different experiences with so many different women and how their lives completely diverged after they broke up. Only lovers too, where you have these two that have, you know, generationally worked out their problems where sometimes they don't even need to live with each other for a hundred years at a time. One lives in Tangier, the other one lives in Detroit. And then, but they still can always find each other because, you know, they've, they figured each other out throughout the, the decades. Uh, but then, you know, you have the stark contrast of 
Mia, the the younger sister. You, you know, she's yeah. this lively, and it's just so funny that she her last line is "You guys are snobs," or <laughs> it's just yeah, like what's well, it's so funny. It's like he condensed Linklater's after trilogy into one movie, yeah, and yeah, framed it as a vampire movie. It's like we have all this time, we can shoot ten boyhoods. <laughs> because we live forever, right? And I, I, it, it showed how relationships are almost cyclical. Yep. And you know. it, it, it that that movie's funny because the the big crux it ends on basically these hipsters having to eat a McDonald's cheeseburger and just being put out by it. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are snobs. Yeah, it's true. Let's talk a little bit about how <laughs> I guess how he's. He's not so far removed from an Adam Sandler. Like, you know, some of his films are just straight up like... Yeah, you're going to have to explain that one. Grown-ups. Like, he just has a troupe, and he has this group of friends, and he just wants to make movies. And, like, uh, like Only Lovers Left to Live uh, was dead on arrival so many times. And he was even like, I am so fucking done with this movie because I can't, like, I keep getting finance dropped from it. Obviously, you know, this is this is a dead project. I want to move on. Tilda Swinton would not let him move on. She's like, no, th- this is a sign that this just isn't the right time. They, they worked on that movie for seven years. Um, and that's, like... His his little group, his little inner circle, is so virulent to to work. Like he has the key to Bill Murray's uh, vacation home. He's just like I, I don't think anyone else has. He's like I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'll show up one day when I'm really stressed out and I take Bill up on his offer, and there'll be 25 other you know people there. Who knows? It's Bill Murray, but he, yeah, Tilda Swinton's his Uma Thurman, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, she's the Uma Thurman to his Quentin Tarantino. Right? He's the only person that shoots Tilda Swinton, like, kind of sexually, too, which is, you know, usually she's doing, like, some kind of horrific character, like in uh, Snowpiercer or something, but he's like, no, she's... She's so... She can do anything. If anyone who watches this show knows I don't hold actors in very high regard, because I think anybody can do it. I I, I don't think the fact that Tara Reid is a shitty actress means that it's hard. <laughs> And I don't think the fact that Daniel Day-Lewis insists on sleeping on a straw mattress and being called Abraham Lincoln for nine months <laughs> means it's hard. I don't think the fact that Mickey Rourke insists, is like, oh, my guy wears a hearing aid in The Wrestler. I won't do this movie if I can't wear a hearing aid. I don't think that means acting's hard. Right. But every once in a while, somebody will just disappear into 100 different roles. And I think Tilda Swinton can do anything. So well, she's great. But guess what is hard? Like filmmaking, dealing with these crazy assholes and ringing them in <laughs> is hard, like, right? Oh, okay. So Wesley Snipes is going to insist on being called Blade and he's only going to per- communicate with me through post-it notes. <laughs> cool. Right. And Jarmish is a guy that's not like, okay, there's only one way to deal with actors. So I got to scream at him like David O. Russell would. <laughs> he's just like, whatever. I'm going to get post-it notes from Wesley. Blade. Uh, from Blade now. <laughs> <laughs> they they were they were resetting a scene while filming uh Dead Don't Die and they were on the craziest of of time constraints. They only had 3 weeks to shoot with Adam Driver because he was he was doing Star Wars. And so uh at one point Bill Murray basically like stole uh, Chloe Savine or however you say her name and uh, Adam Driver and they just took off and they went to a like some farm and they're just like we're gonna take all these oranges we're good for it we'll, we'll give you money later and he's they took the prop police car and just kind of joy road uh, so they didn't have to just kind of sit there and he's like yeah cool or conversely like with this dog he Forrest Whitaker really wanted to get into into the character where he wanted to kind of method act and so he and so jim jarmusch let pigeons take a shit on it <laughs> or they until went... he got trichinosis it right. was am- it was amazing method acting from forrest whitaker they they went and bought pizza in the west village it wasn't like a huge thing but, <laughs> you know, you know it, it's just like he he's such a a student of i mean he's such a film dork and in, in such a a, a nerd for the craft that he just allows people to to be the, themselves, and, and that's how he gets the the best performances. Well, and look at the movies he made. You know, he made basically the Lost in Translation movie. Mm-hmm. He made Le Samurai. Basically, Ghost Dog was Le Samurai, but like the Riza version of it. 
You know, he made the zombie movie and the vampire movie. <laughs> you know, he made Patterson was his uh, uh, Luan Davis, you know? Yeah, yeah. He, he didn't make any movie twice. He's no Wes Anderson, you know? he's He'll make a movie once and then just do something completely different. He made a Western, but he made his own Western, you know? Right. He made his Pulp Fiction, but it was, you know, like basically 11 music videos. It's just, it's really interesting. You know, the the that he basically never tried to make the same movie twice. He's just he writes what he's, you know, finds inspiring. He's he's even though he's he comes off as an elitist, he's just he is a super everyman. Like he became a film fan because his parents would just drop him off at, you know, the the dollar cinema where they played like three horror movies and and you know, he just stayed and, and watched these. Like ETA's father used to be he used to host something with like Tim Conaway. And they, they would do this, like, bit show. And so he was more of a fan of, of uh, Paul Thomas Anderson's father. And he's like, the one time I got to meet Paul, I just geeked out and wanted to talk about his father, and he wasn't into it, you know? like <laughs> <laughs> So it's just like, he just comes from such a, you know, he's a dude from Cleveland, Ohio, that is, it, it, like, all of he's his... He's from Akron, I think. Or Akron, yeah, Akron, yeah. He, he's, just a, he's just a guy that is such a fan of the things that he, he makes. Like, he you know, he plays... He plays music and, and squirrel, uh, emphasis on the on the way Americans say it, like uh, Kate squirrel. Blanchett says in in uh, in uh, Coffee and Cigarettes. But that that's nothing comes off as half assed because he's just too much of a fan to let it be half assed. He's a guy that I could watch hours and hours of interviews with him too. Um, yeah, where you know as opposed well to, we both did right <laughs> right. <laughs> That's what we're forced to do when we do one of these. Um, but I wasn't I wasn't pissed off about it this time. It wasn't watching weird, quippy, you know, twitchy interviews like Wes Anderson. Again, Wes Anderson's great, but he's just miserable to to hear talk. <laughs> I honestly I feel like you learned so much about about what they did successfully, whether or not it was on purpose. Yeah. Watching an interview. I feel like I thought I really liked Nicholas winning Refn <laughs> until I watched him interview and I'm like, oh God, everything smart he did was an accident. Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> but like hearing Jarmish on like Charlie Rose or, you know, shows like that, like everything was, was deliberate, you know, and just uh, hearing him talk so much about what his collaborators added to the project versus what he did as a director, I, I think was really refreshing so like it wasn't a chore to see him interviewed a bunch really see his influences too as far as filmmakers go like he he was a big john waters fan that's why everything is so you know minimalistic and shoestring budget like th this guy can make a movie for nothing and the studios will well, still he, complain about it he he had to right because you know because of his, you know, five roles, basically. He's like, yeah, don't let the fuckers get you. And Jarmish is a guy who's, like, made some movies that lost some independent backers some money and are cult classics, you know? He's right. made a lot of great movies, and he's hasn't been that successful at the box office because he doesn't have any studio really pushing the movie because he doesn't want to let the fuckers get him, and I really respect that. I find it very telling that he... Once a project is over, he doesn't think about it. He wants to move on as far as as that particular story goes. He likes watching a, a film, a completed film of his with a paying audience incognito just to get some real reactions because screeners and, and all the you know releases aren't real as far as yeah. if you want. Everyone's, everyone is there at the premiere to clap for your movie. Yeah, yeah. And... The, the stories, he's just like, get out of here, you know, I'm done with this. But the characters linger with him. And I think that's why he, he picks the same collaborators. And even, like like I said, this kind of goes back to my, my Adam Sandler comparison. But, like, he'll he used, like, some of the the, the exact same gangster characters from Ghost Dog. And he, and he put them in, he gave them their own little vignette in, in Coffee and Cigarettes. You know, his... his constant uh use of iggy pop whether him being just you know a, a zombie you drink. could use anybody <laughs> with like a troop you know like like judd apatow but no you had to say adam sandler 
to hurt me. <laughs> oh man, yeah, but even the, even some lines like there, there's a line in um in Ghost Dog where he's just like, "Is he dead?" And he's like, uh, "He's he's not he's not aging anymore, right? Or he's not getting any older." He's and not the, getting any older. The same exact line is used in uh, Dead Don't Die. Yep. There's so many Jarmuschian Easter eggs throughout his entire filmography, which is... It, which and is, unlike Sam Mendes, who wrote, you know, a, a lengthy list of rules to be a happier director and would have bristled at anything being referred to as Mendesian, uh, I don't think that Jarmusch would mind us using the term Jarmuschian. Right. He loves the smell of his own vegetarian farts. Which is, great. <laughs> I mean, you got to though, right? Like, he doesn't have an ego though, because the yeah. same the one thing we talked about that out of the the list of rules that he had in common with Mendez was let other people give you their good ideas, and if you have if you're too much of an egomaniac, you're like I'm the director. You don't. You're not a good collaborator. You're right. a tyrant. You're a director, not a dictator. On the ledge to say that he is a collaborator more so than a than a director. Well, I, well, he has to control so much of the process. Like, he has to do the primary writing. He can't pay somebody to do that. You know, he just makes the the stuff he want to make. He, he makes the movies he would want to watch. And the fact that he has to control so much of it is is due to the fact that he just doesn't have the money to pay other people to do some of the stuff versus, like, him not his ego not being able to handle it. Yeah. The films never turn out a huge profit, but the, the but the people that f- do the work and find them, or or the or the collaborators he works with, and these are like real people, right? Like Adam Driver took time off to do freaking Star Wars, make a billion dollars to go be in this weird fucking kind of zombie movie for three weeks, just hanging I, I'm, out with I'm, Bill Murray. I'm glad you think Rise of Skywalker is going to make a billion dollars. It's going to make like five billion dollars. <laughs> Uh, I I don't know, but Ray's I, got two lightsabers. I, I liked <laughs> I, I liked the last one. I liked Ryan Johnson's take. So like I realize that makes me you know an idiot clearly, but <laughs> no, it makes it makes me a hipster to say I didn't like. I mean that's this is a whole other tangent, but you know it's I'm just I'm just saying like the the people that his fans and his collaborators are so protective over him. You see like uh, interviews with him. It almost makes him feel uncomfortable. He's just like, I'm just a dude, just like whatever. I'm a fan of, of the art and, and you guys, like, I just want to, I just want to make a thing with, with you guys. And they're just like, no, like, well, Jeremy's fans feel like Tom Waits fans to me. Yeah. Do you know any Tom Waits fans? People who are like, that's their shit. Like, you know, the, the, the people in my life who were super Tom Waits fans, they they kind of like the Jaramushian and aesthetic and like you know they're super chill easy people to get along with. Yeah, for as much whiskey as <laughs> as Tom Waits fans <laughs> drink, right? Yeah, they're pretty docile. It's just he's just I mean, trailblazer as far as the indie genre goes, and I just hope that he's not like the last of it. You know, we we do have some some good ones popping up here and there, like a Jeremy Sonye. You're making Blairs out there. Yeah, you know what? They're they're making movies for Netflix. Yeah, because as much as Amazon. Yeah, well, Soderbergh, you know, a guy I keep going back to, and I hate to keep harping on this, but like, if you go to our Soderbergh episode, we linked the uh, the state of the industry address he did, and here's a guy who like understands Hollywood better than anybody. He's like, look, Hollywood is making the avengers now and i'm going to make a movie on my iphone and the second he made two movies on his iphone and then they gave him 30 million dollars and he sold the movie directly to netflix (laughs) so a guy like soderbergh knows what's up yeah you know he's like look you don't need to see patterson on the big screen you don't need to see uh Whatever the that basketball movie Soderbergh made, that doesn't need to be on the. Big, <laughs> some of the stuff can just get sold to Netflix, and uh, I, I feel like if somebody like Jarmusch wants to make a few more movies, he's going to be real comfortable in a world where it's like, look, let Amazon or Hulu or Disney Plus just buy your shit, and don't worry about having to deal with. There was a really great quote I just I saw in an interview where Jarmusch was talking about is like you don't have to deal with someone who was a very successful at running an underwear company and now they're a Hollywood executive. 
Because you don't get to be a Hollywood executive by being a really good Hollywood. You get to be a Hollywood executive by being a really good executive. Right. It's like, oh, this guy was just at FedEx Kinko's and he's going to tell us how to make a the third Maleficent movie. Like, <laughs> it doesn't scan. Business. They just care about it as a business yeah. and not as, like, a pursuit. And that was, like, the number one thing about Jarmusch. He's had such a low-key career and could have made so much more money just playing ball, and he just didn't because he couldn't. Yeah. And I, I, that's if that's it. The only thing you know about Jim Jarmusch is that he told Hollywood to go pound sand. Like, that's all you need to know. Yeah. He, he never tried to play out of, his, out of his, his wheelhouse. His mentor, John Waters, he accidentally made a, a, a huge smash with – with hairspray and then didn't know what the fuck to do how to follow that up he's just like <laughs> this is successful why is this successful i don't know what to do where jim jarvis is just like no i'm just gonna make these i'm just gonna write direct these original things some people are gonna like authentic. it some people are gonna hate it yeah authentic not original <laughs> originality doesn't exist that's right all right well that's our that's our episode ladies and gents uh, I that hope is our know. authentic episode about jim jarmusch yeah <laughs> adam sandler on prozac um you son of a bitch <laughs> if you ever want to piss jason alt off you're just, just saying that to hurt me just bring up adam sandler or uh nicholas winding reffin just tell him that he's a... <laughs> just, I'm so mad because I was like, I think Nicholas Winning Griffin may be my favorite director. And then right. I see every interview I see with him, I'm like, oh, this guy's a moron. Oh, no. <laughs> right. <laughs> Where Jim Jarmusch, they're they asking, they're like, so, you know, a vampire, why, why vampire? He's just like, well, you know, because they're cool and you have to follow all these, all these rules like uh, garlic and holy water and, and all this. He's just like, I added the leather gloves because they just look cool. I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> well, you know what's really funny? I know we're trying to end this episode, but uh, they say that you make vampire movies when the economy's good and zombie movies when the economy's bad. Right, when the yeah. economy's good, they're like, we're going to live forever. We're going to look like we're 21 for 200 years. I'm yeah. for Sutherland. Woo! <laughs> the 80s. Greed is good. And then when the economy's shitty, you're like, oh, no, I really wish all my student loan debt could get reset. Yeah. And if that happens because zombies go into Fifth Third Bank and eat everyone's brains, and then instead of my job where I drive for Uber when I'm not driving for Postmates, I get to crack zombie skulls open and, like, find cans of beans in an old 7-Eleven. <laughs> that could be my new life. That sounds a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> That's why zombie movies do really good when the economy's shitty, and vampire movies do really good when the economy's great. And he made a vampire and a zombie movie like three years apart because the man does not give a fuck what the economy's doing. Jim Jarmusch makes the movies Jim Jarmusch wants to make. Please uh, go check this out also on podcast formats. Leave all the the stuff, the apples, the oranges uh, on iTunes or Spotify. Yeah, give us five oranges on iTunes. That would <laughs> yeah. be immensely helpful. Exactly. Uh, thumbs up the video. <laughs> Just Johnny YouTube telling you to thumbs up the video. Three, two, one. Burr, burr, burr. Burr, smash that bell icon to get notifications when we do a future episode. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Just tell your friends about this. This is a fun project and more people. Make will... friends. Tell them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Love talking about film uh, right here on this very channel. Also on Twitter, at Orzov Dunn. Mr. Jason Eugene Alt. <laughs> I'm uh, Jason E. Alt on the Twitterverse. And if you'll notice at the very top of my profile, I have a pin post where you can see all the many other projects I do on the web. I'm not just a movie aficionado. I also wear other many hats and you can see what i'm up to on the twitterverse follow me on twitter for more excellent insights like uh jarvis likes music i guess now we're gonna kill this episode like it was uh you know murdered by a wild animal or a couple of or a japanese tourist something beautiful in the cyclical nature of of life and death and I, I really like the Zoroastrian idea where they put your dead body on a mountain and let vultures eat it, you know? <laughs> I'd kind of like that, something like that. Anyway, I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> uh.